One of the things that I observed was that people bring Bibles to funerals. And so you'll go to one funeral and they'll put them in heaven. You go to another funeral, they'll put them back in the grave. 
and you just really don't know what's being said. And so I believe when I, I did the eulogy for Rodney King, and I said, all these people are going to be out there, and none of them are going to bring Bibles. So I started typing up an outline, because I don't preach with notes. And that could mean I'm lazy or gifted, whichever one you want, and I think it might be the first. So I'm going to ask if you would hand out the outline, and that way we don't have to go through the whole sermon, but you can read what I would have preached in its entirety when you get home. If the ushers would start from the front and give that handout out at this time. While they're doing that, <clears throat> while they're giving you that, growing up as a Seventh-day Adventist, but not paying attention to the teachings of the church, and living in a home and, and hearing more of what I should be, but those around me were not, experiencing a imbalanced doctrinal um, teachings, and I say imbalanced, an uh, imbalance of justice, I would say, whereas now we're, we're kind of out of balance when it comes to grace. But I really found God on a whole nother level when the Lord blessed me to go through a very fiery experience. Can the family get a copy? Do they, have, they don't have a copy. It may look like it, but that's not. Okay, thank you. And thank you. And the Lord blessed me to go through a beautiful, fiery experience. And through that experience, I was able to really see that the most important thing and the only thing that Jesus cares about are people. Now, I want everybody to hear that. God is not concerned with anything more than the salvation of all of his children. Many of them will be saved, and all they ever did is talk to Buddha. God could not trust them in churches that talked about Jesus because of some of the hypocrisy and hatred and harsh judgmental attitudes that are found in the church. It does not take away from Christ, but the Desire of Ages, which is not just an ordinary book, it's a book that was written by a prophetess, it's clear that many people are going to be saved, that Christ is going to personally send angels to minister to. One of the things that, that, that I found a little disconcerting is that many people would, 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 would say, I learned of Jonathan's death. I received several phone calls, and they would first they would say, well, did, did he get shot? And I think it's terrible that people have to think when a young black man dies, the first question is, in America that is, did he get shot? That, that, that's troubling. But then they would say, well, well, were drugs found in his system? And even his father made a real point to say that there were no drugs, and everybody said, oh, hey, man, what if it was? What if the autopsy, when you die, could show that gossip was in your blood? <laughs> or what if it showed backbiting? What if it showed that you were bold to talk behind somebody's back, but when you walked in their face, you had a... Jonathan smile. See, God says one thing about judging. Don't. We don't serve a God that has a young man in a car after a night of living contrary to how he was raised that waits and hopes that he could go, Jesus, while he dies. That's not the God we serve. That's not love. You live 25 years in, in, in a moment or a night, he's just going to, okay, I'm playing, call it, call it, call Jesus. No, you, you know, it's like when you, if you give me $100 and say this is yours, I can spend it when I want to. When Jonathan prays, God can apply the prayer when he wants to. God does not operate like us. 
We are, we, we are hateful and judgmental and hard and, and, and because of it, we, we look at God as being hard and harsh and many people, they don't want our God. And it's not because of anything Jesus has done. It's not because of anything God has done. It's because he has trusted us to show people who he is and we've blown it. Nobody's going to accidentally make it to heaven. We live in a generation where the young Seventh-day Adventists don't have a clue of their value, of who they really are. While young Muslims are being taught who they are, and they're being pushed some very strategic, serious buttons where they won't bring certain things in their temple because they reverence God regardless of who liked it or who didn't. They're going to look to who they believe is God. We are being wiped away because we don't know that God has called you as young people into the Seventh-day Adventist church with a purpose that only you can fulfill. And he has given you a message that only this church has. But it cannot be born through mere intellect and theological uh, uh, learning. It is only born by the outpouring of God's Spirit, which comes through a gentle, personal, day-by-day -day experience with God himself. To think that God himself will talk to me. God. I'm not insecure about how you feel. God's my friend. God. Jesus. I am sad that there'll be people who will want to go to heaven and God will look and say, I'm sorry. You can't go. But why, Lord? Because Stephen Lewis is... You don't like him. We have to love each other. And love doesn't try to cover things. Love does not look at someone and introduce to them or support them in darkness and error. I'm thankful that every conversation I had with Jonathan was spiritual. That I never left him without praying or saying something about God. See, see, and, and young people, you have to be strength for each other because we're all under an attack and none of us have really figured it out. Every day we're going through a new journey. Every day is a war. And the war is not about you. It's Satan's desire to get a final blow on Christ. God is not impressed with any of us. Neither is the devil impressed with us. But God loves us. And Satan knows that if you're lost, it's going to break the heart of Christ. In the final analysis, whereas today you may be crying for Jonathan, if you don't intentionally say, Lord, teach me thy ways. Help me get to know you. Then Jonathan, at the end of the thousand years, will be crying for you. He'll cry for you. God is lonely for you. What do you love the most? What do you think about the most? What are your thoughts like? That's what's being recorded in heaven. It's okay to talk to God, friend. And it's okay to talk to him respectfully. It's okay to cry to him as a father, but it's not okay to think that he as a person can just be used. God chose to use that concept of a marriage. The concept of a marriage to show and identify with God and his people. It's not ironic that the first and last thing that this family celebrated was a wedding. It was a wedding. And now, facing a death, when Jesus comes, it's going to be a wedding, but prior to it ending, it's going to be a death. 
and everybody in that death is going to be cremated. Not because God wants it, but because I didn't want God. Now, I want you ladies to especially listen a moment, because you may be able to really identify with this. You see, the biggest problem that we're facing in Christendom today, it's not only a Seventh-day Adventist problem, because God has children in many churches, and many of them are more spiritual in other churches. Than none of them... None of them are under the type of assault by the satanic forces that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is coming under because none of them have what God has given us. And even now, Heavenly Father, I pray for those families who lost their children in that shooting here in Orlando last night. Some of them may not have the hope that this family has. Please send angels. Please send real Christians that will not go and try to turn this into something that God. Please, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. 20 people shot and killed, or 50 now, in a club, whether it was a gay club or a regular club. Daniel wasn't at the party. And if you don't know who Daniel is, that's the Christian in it when everybody else was partying in Daniel chapter 5. Christians are now doing things that Christ isn't doing. You see, the trouble is we don't know anymore what a Christian is. When I got high and partied, I knew when the Sabbath came, if I saw Adventists in the party, I would make them go home. If it was on Friday, I would make them go home. Because I knew, how, well, I knew that they had been to the academies and I knew what their parents were trying to teach them and I chose to, to lend my life to the devil, but, but, but you're not going to do it with me. You see, there's certain things you guys, when you know the truth, shouldn't do with each other. If you slip, you fall, you get caught up, okay, but, but, but not together because we know. We know. But back to these ladies, real quick. The greatest problem is this word, and. A and D. And. We want God. And. We don't just want God. We always, in our prayers, we want something more than just God and rent. God and our spouse. God and. Yes, Lord, give me you. And as a result, we're not really, we're not willing to do what Christ said, and that is to give up everything so that we won't lose anything. Now, a lady has found herself many times in a relationship where she looks at a man and said, is that all you want from me? You don't want me. And a woman doesn't want a man that doesn't want her, that doesn't want her mind, if all he wants is physical. But that's how God feels. That's how God feels when all we want is something from him or we want to talk to him when we have a need. And God is a person. That's why he's called he. And that's why he says, touch me. That's why he says, taste. That's why he says, hear. He's a person and he wants to develop a relationship where you can be trusted with him giving you all that he has. And many of us, have bought into this fly-by-night, competitive, emotional type of church thing where, 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 the, where, where, where worship is about me. It is not about God. And parents, we're at a point where now we want to adjust everything to make the children happy because a child shall lead them. That's in heaven, animals that a child's going to lead. We have to now look at this and say, wait a minute, Lord. You took the Christ from us. You say, wait a minute, John wasn't Christ. But all of those characteristics that we heard, that was Christ. And the way we see Christ is through Jonathan's smile. And through all those different words, integrity, discipline, excited, energetic. I can't remember all the descriptive words where God had loaned us this young fella to try to show us what he's like. 
And he didn't judge people. He wasn't hard. It was hard for him to say no. And we cannot look at this moment and literally walk away and think that there's anything good from it unless you say, Lord, I need to learn to love Jesus more than I love Jonathan. I need a relationship with you. In your sermon outline, if you look at this one text, and then I'll close. And I love you, brothers and sisters. I promise I do. I've been praying for you because God loves you so much and he wants to see us all saved, but he will not force you to be saved. If you really don't want to be saved, you won't be. God's not going to push it. He's not going to jump in there and say, okay, here's someone that really doesn't want to be here. Here's someone that would really be miserable in heaven. And it's not about trying to change and adjust what you're doing. It's not about trying to stop what you're doing. It's about incorporating Christ into what you're doing. He's an intelligent God that says, come, let us reason together. Let me show you why my way is a better way. My thoughts are not yours. He's an intelligent God. And he wants you. And he's longing for you. But he doesn't want you to feel that he's going to make you do anything or that you have to do it out of fear. When you spend moments with him, I don't know what lifestyle is. As a matter of fact, any lifestyle that is different from the lifestyle in the Garden of Eden is an alternative lifestyle. Because the Garden of Eden was the perfect mind of Christ in man. And when you are really in Christ, you allow the Spirit of Christ to live through you. So when you look at Romans on your paper, Paul says, I'm writing to them that know the law. And he goes on to say, there was a woman that had a husband, and this woman had a husband and met another man. Now, somebody said, hmm, because that's a problem. Now, here's a married woman, and don't miss this, because this is the crust of why we have death. This is why God chose death as the response or the waiting point for him to come after sin. There's a woman. This woman had a husband. Now this woman meets another man. And she falls in love with this other man because he's thoughtful. He's caring. He's a provider. He's so gentle. He's so kind. And, and, and she just starts adoring him and, and to the point where she wants to marry him. But he says, wait a minute, I can't marry you because I'm a Christian. And the law of God says that you're married. And if I marry you, I commit adultery. But if your husband dies, then the same law that says I cannot marry you permits me to marry you. God, through this illustrious illustration, is showing what must happen if he is to save us. The woman in this illustration represents you as a person. You. The woman represents you. The husband represents your carnal mind, your natural mind. We naturally think and feel. The law of God, of course, is the Ten Commandments because it's speaking of adultery, and the other man is Jesus. And so here's a woman that's married, or all of us, who we're used to operating in our carnal minds, doing things the way we want to do it, and now we meet Christ for a moment. And we fall in love with Christ because I've never known anyone to meet him and really give him a chance. I'm not talking about going to church. I'm not talking about uh, uh, hearing a sermon. I'm talking about you getting somewhere and you saying to God, Lord, introduce yourself to me. God isn't insecure. He's not insecure at all. He will do it. He would do it. So, 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 so now you, 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 you meet Christ, and now Christ says, I want to marry you. I want to bring your mind into a position where I can save you, but I cannot save you as long as your carnal mind, that husband, is in operation. Why? Because the carnal mind, according to Romans 8, hates God. The carnal mind loves something that is an alternative to God's way, whether it's diet or dress or social or whatever 
you like to do that is contrary to the word of God, that's the natural thing for the carnal mind to do. That's the husband that we must allow Christ to kill so that his mind can be resurrected in us. And Jesus cannot marry you unless you are willing to allow me to give you a new mind. Heaven would be a miserable place if we get there, brothers and sisters, and operate in our minds. Because every one of us, at some point, we have a sin, we have something that is contrary to God. This is why we need to stop judging and looking and trying to make everybody worse than us and say, woe is me, I am undone. In our carnal mind, every one of us would have said, kill and let Barabbas go free. And today, I'm asking you to simply say in your own way, in your own terms, at your own time, Lord, introduce yourself to me. And for those who already know him and you have had evidence of him moving in your life, just say, Lord, I need you to bring me closer and nearer and teach me how to cooperate with you. To teach me how to get to a point where I'm not holy that my neighbors don't know you. I can work on a job for years and without preaching and nobody joined the church. Brothers and sisters, you're the only Jesus and we're running out of time family members in this room, you say you love each other, then offer to teach your family what you believe. Please, every Seventh-day Adventist in this room recognizes that without a moment's warning, the world is going to turn on us. For those of you visiting, I love you. I'm not trying to bash or knock your religion. The majority of my friends are not Seventh-day Adventists. And even when I went through my fire, so-called Adventists, they were gossiping and believing lies and doing everything to kill me. They weren't trying to help me because they were hurt. It wasn't because they didn't like me. They're in pain. People in pain lash out. That's what people do. And do you know how many of us are hurting in this room? Do you know how many are hurting in church? We, we, we need to really learn people's story and pray for people. But their time is coming. And you non-Seventh-day Adventists, those who are not, ask your family members what I'm talking about. Jonathan knew very clearly that a time was coming, should he live, that the world was going to turn on every Seventh-day Adventist. And it's here. We see all the evidence. But the love of Jesus and the power of an unrealized Christ in your life is going to draw thousands, even millions, and you young people are the ones that God is going to use because he's always used young people. From Daniel and his three comrades to John and Andrew and Philip, these were young men to Christ himself, young people, who in whom they believe. Even this great church, young people. Jay and Andrews was 15, Uriah Smith 12, Ellen 18, 16, James 19, young people. This is why you're under an attack. Nobody's trying to tell you what you can and cannot do. There's a force trying to shut you down because you're a threat to the world. You are a threat to the world. He was a threat to the world. And I call upon you to ask God, show me how to kill my husband. Show me how to die to self. Show me how to making it about me and always about me and start praying for those who you see are walking in a way that you know they shouldn't walk start wrestling in prayer and ask God to help them like you need and ask God to have mercy on them like you want mercy and I promise if you do that your whole life will change I promise if you cry out to God like that nothing will ever be different you can never stop the vices.
but those vices can't stop God. Let me repeat, some of you think you have to do something to get to God. No, you don't. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. It doesn't change. While we were yet, Christ died. Matter of fact, it says he strengthened his love. There was a story of a little boy. This little boy was something like me, always in I mean, always in trouble. And this mother and father couldn't handle him, so when the summer came, they sent the boy out to the country to be with his grandfather. And his grandfather would get up and say, oh boy, go, go and play, sister with you. Grandfather would just say, boy, just go play out in the woods because you can't get in trouble out in the woods. It's safe out in the woods. The little boy's just out there playing and playing. And then all of a sudden, as he was playing, he looked down and he saw that a little bird had fallen from a nest. He picked the little bird up and started playing with the little bird, playing with the bird. And before this gentle, loving, playfulness could continue, a thought came to his mind. There goes that old devilish mind. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to my grandfather. And I'm going to ask my grandfather. I'm going to say, Grandfather, I bet you can't tell me what's in my hand. And if the bird should chirp, and he says, a bird, I'm going to say, okay, well, 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 you tell me, is he alive? Or was that me? Is he really dead? And little boy started running through the woods. He was so excited because I got granddaddy now. I got him. I got him. And he starts screaming, granddaddy, 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 granddaddy. And, and the grandfather was in the house and he came out and he looked and he said, granddaddy, he said, what is it, boy? What is it? And with bated breath, he said, Granddad, Granddad, I, I, I bet you can't tell me what's in my hand. And he said, Oh, son, you have a bird in your hands. I bet you can't tell me, is he alive or is he dead? You see, if he said he was alive, he was going to squeeze him gently and drop him. If he said he was dead, he was going to open his hand. Is he alive or is he dead? Is he alive or is he dead? And the grandfather paused. And said, it's in your hands. It's in your hands. Believe whatever you want to believe. You can do whatever you want to do. But when it comes to whether or not Christ saves you, he's done all he could do. There's no except believe, confess stuff. That's not in the Bible. The Bible says in Timothy that before the world was created, Jesus forgave you. Accept what he's done for you. It's in your hands. Christ didn't do anything to us. We don't understand it all. But it's in your hands right now what you will do with this opportunity. Nobody can cause you to be lost. Nobody can cause you to get what God has for you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And at this moment, I'd like for you to make a decision. If you've never accepted Christ, I'd like you to say, Lord, I don't understand all this stuff. But if you're real, I want you to introduce yourself to me. If you've experienced God, but you know that you've walked away from some things that you know were beneficial. God never tells us to do something that's not beneficial. Some people get on me because I'm a vegetarian. That's beneficial. God's not telling me I'm going to be saved because of it. I want you to be in health. It's not about heaven. It's about health. But I've walked away from principles where I could be closer to you, Lord. And today, you sent out this invitation. Today, you set this appointment up. I want to come higher, Lord. Then 
finally, there are one or two people that have really been getting up and said, seriously praying for people. Praying for people, not gossiping about the problems in the church and what the past is not doing and what members aren't and who's doing what and who's living this life. And No, 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 but praying for people. There's some people who really have been serious about God. And you want to say, Lord, I want more of your spirit. Everybody in this room can fall into one of those categories. But I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you, and I want to start with the young people. There are things out of respect that weren't mentioned at this funeral. And you love Jonathan, and you want a meeting when he comes, and you want to say, Lord, I want to give you my heart. Take my heart. I can't give it. Today, I want to recommit my life. See, I buried my son. But he wasn't like Jonathan. He was beautiful. He got shot in the head and killed. It took four years. I never questioned God. I just scratched him off. Never going to see my son again. Four years later, God showed me clearly that this is not about you. I'm not like you. You're going to see him in heaven. In the same way he did that for Shemar, it took four years. But I want you to know today, the decision you make today, God can make that decision while he's sealing you. So as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, young people who are not afraid, I want you to stand right now if you want to consecrate. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. I want to start with the young people. Amen. Amen. Lord, take my heart. I can't give it. Amen. I'm not going to drag this out. I think the love of God has been explained. Amen. Amen. Any more young people? Lord, I can't stop this and stop that. God's not asking you to do that. You don't ever find God asking you to do anything with a come. He says, come. 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 Amen. As a matter of fact, young people, come down in front. I want to hug you now. Come on. Come on down. Not all of you, just one brother. But all of you come, but one brother I want to hug right now because this is whose home Jonathan died at. Come on down and put your arms around him. Stay here. His friends are coming. No, they got up when you, but when you get up, man, God bless you. Stay with these young people. Surround him. Make sure you don't leave without giving him your name and email and whatever you do. And multiply the presence of Jonathan in his life so that Christ's presence will be multiplied. If you're giving your heart to God, come down. Young people, come. This is why God had this day. More will be understood, but the central purpose is God loves you. And he knows. He knows how empty this thing is. He knows how, how, how vain we're, we're trying to navigate through this thing called life. And we're trying our best and we just don't know. But I'm telling you, God cares. And he would dispatch angels to be with each one of you young people to help you to make sure that you will look up when the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. God is going to call you and he has great things for you. Great things. And he can use you because your minds are still impressionable. And you have the energy and you're not afraid. And you, 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 you don't have to just, just say, I'm a Christian to people. Just smile. And I disagreed with the statement that was set up here. The brother said, my smile is not as beautiful as Jonathan's. Everybody's smile is equally as beautiful. When you smile, God beams through. Heavenly Father. In the name of Jesus, I commend these young people to you. I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill them. I pray that you would dispatch special angels from heaven to anoint them, to whisper in their ear and nudge them. And regardless to what they're doing, may they bring you into it. 
the same way, Lord, I would pray while I was smoking. And I would say, Lord, look at me. I need your help. And the devil wanted, want, 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 you to, want you to think that you have to wait till you quit that stuff. No! Call on God. Call on him. He loves you. And the devil knows. When you buy into this, I have to do. No, it's what Christ has done and is doing and will do. You just say, Lord, take my heart. And he will navigate the rest. Those who have known God before, I invite you to stand if you want to be a part of this prayer. And those who have been doing what God has asked you to do, I invite you to stand at this time as we close. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for what you have done for these young people that we have not seen. We're thankful for the power and the manifestation of the glory of God that will be revealed through their mouths and their touch. And now, Lord, the rest who stood. Help our unbelief, Lord. We don't believe that you can save us. We, we're so hard on ourselves. Help us to forgive ourselves. Those of us who have been beat up by the devil saying, I wish I would have done this for Jonathan. I wish I would have done that. It was done so that he could be saved. Let us know that we are forgiven. And let us move forward with a purpose. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you turn and just hug somebody? Women, women, just, just give each other a hug. Amen. 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 Thank you.